welcome Melbourne. Hey, um, can I just get a uh, summary of anyone who's been into our venue? Can everyone just stand up, please? Stand up with your feet. Everybody, that includes you. Everybody stand up, please. Okay, everyone, arms like this. Okay. If, you've been, if you've been to the venue, please put your hands together. A standing ovation. Thank you very much. It's not what you know, it's what you can prove. Um, <laughs> uh, as Je You can sit down now, thank you very much. <laughs> um, as Jane um, mentioned, um, my name is Rob Libikins. I come from Caretakers Coach. I'm one of three owners. Um, myself, Ryan, who isn't here, he he's not dead, he's just at the venue. Uh, and Matthew Sterling, just on the end of the, uh, of the row there. Um, it's probably best off that... We kind of just explain what our venue is for the people that um, haven't been there. Um, we are a 107-year-old cottage behind a church in the CBD. Um, the kind of cottage has gone through like many lives. So originally it's where the caretakers of the grounds would have lived uh, for maintenance, maintenance on the church and that kind of stuff. That happened. So like families lived there for maybe about 80 years. Um, after that, they had um, the use of like humanitarian aid for refugee families living in the venue um, until they found permanent homes. And after that, they had squatters, drug dealers, um, and the kind of house fell into disrepair. So just wasn't, wasn't fit for use for, for many years. Probably took about 10 years to kind of restructure, rebrace the house, redo the roof, floors, everything. Uh, and that's kind of where we kind of come in. So we'd been looking for a venue for maybe, what, about three or four years, Matt? I would say we, we probably comfortably edged over 200 venues that we went and viewed for our first bar. And with that, there's just so much heartbreak, you know, two, three years of looking at venues that either weren't right or were right, got to the sticky end of it, about to sign, something happened. It's just like years of heartbreak kind of lead you to this point. So when you do get over the line, it just, it feels like you've earned it. And that's even before you've even put anything into place. So I would say that anyone that is looking to own a bar, really do stick with it because not dreams do come true. This is a fucking nightmare, but, uh, um, um, but it's my nightmare, not yours. Um, so I think, yeah, that's kind of explains who we are. Um, we are a music focused venue really. So um, I was saying to somebody before that we spent 20% of our budget for an entire build um, on our sound system. So we had a quarter of a million dollars that we'd negotiated or had our, ourselves. And I had to ring the architect up and tell him to remove 20% of the budget um, to which he said, you can't do that. And I said, I have. I'll show you the invoices. So like working with limitations was, was a big thing for us. Working with me is a fucking limitation in, in, in its most basic form. But because um, we're a music focused venue, I wanted to kind of do the running order of this to the context of Biggie Smalls, the 10 crack commandments. So um, how we did it, like we've got to the point where we found the venue, we know we love it. Three days after we found the venue, we went into the lockdown, the, f the first lockdown as well. So it, p it poses so many challenges. What it does give you is opportunity as well. Like we knew that no one legally could go and see the venue. So we knew we could drag our heels a little bit. We also knew that, yeah, we we're going to be in lockdown. There was no end point. No one told you it's going to end on this date. So we also knew that Melbourne, Melbourne is like the heartbeat of like food and drink scene in Australia. I truly believe that. It's one of the best in the world. It's certainly the best in this country. So we knew that at some point that we would reopen and Melbourne would get back to its best and probably even better because of the adversity. So we viewed the site, loved it, dragged our heels for six months on negotiations. And what kind of they put in, what the developers put in front of us was pretty average, not gonna lie. High rent, no incentive. So we kind of walked away. And what walking away does is not only backs yourself, you realize that because we'd gone through so much adversity, because we'd seen so many venues that we knew that might be another three years, but we knew that we'd find something else. What that meant as well, though, is that 
you're in such a good position, a unique position that lockdown created was the, the little man could actually have a better role in this. We knew that no one could view the venue, so we knew that we got a really strong position for the first time. Um, when anyone asks us how much money we put into our venue, between the three of us, we put in $35,000 each. You know, we've got, we'd like, we're on track for a $3 million revenue annual turnover. Like, and I think in terms of what we've put in, yeah, financially, that's a small amount, but it's also like probably 22 years each of, of, of hospitality experience, working for terrible people, working for pretty awesome people changing jobs and finding something else that we can pull into our own industry. Um, we walked away again when they put the second offer down and that was scary because it was the first time we'd had a good offer and an offer that we could open up with. But I spoke to my dad and my dad was like, walk away again. Like walking away again shows that you're really serious. Um, it also allows you to Oh, well, if they don't up the offer, we'll just take the first, the, the second offer that they put on the table. It's still a good offer. What that actually meant was that they came back with, uh, we don't pay rent until we can actually trade. They give us like $200,000 as an investment. And that meant that we had a business. And what I'm going to say, like, and keep chipping away here is that financial planning is by far the most important thing that you can do in a business. If it doesn't make sense on paper, and I'm talking about even when it's bad, if you can't pay yourselves, you can't pay your suppliers, you can't pay your rent, you've effectively bought yourself a job. Now, it sounds really weird, but even when you sign, there has to be an exit strategy for you. That exit strategy could be different. It could be like, I want to sell my business when it's at the top of its game, that's maybe year one, year two, when it's winning awards, or whatever. It might just be, how do I not work here? And it trades seven days and it's a business that runs. Now those exit strategies are incredibly important to us and it was the first thing that we actually implemented into our financial planning. It's like, how does this business run without us in say three years time? If you don't have that, you don't have that in like a financial or numerical terms, you've bought yourself a job. There's no getting out of that. Um, we chose not to take any outside investment, predominantly because we thought we could do it ourselves. I think the risk we wanted to wear as a driver. Um, the other thing as well, there's like three owners sweating their ass off in a venue. If I had to pay somebody 20, 30, 40, 50% who's not doing the same thing as us just because we took money, I'd find that really hard. Someone that's not in the trenches with you, all right, they helped you get there, but that's it. That's the, that's the end point. That, that for me, it was like, I'd rather build and fail than take safe money and be safe from the get-go. There's no incentive to grow there. Um, what might seem small, you know, $10,000, whatever, just to get you over the line. If you've got to buy those people out in year three when you've got a $10 million business, it's going to be, you know, upwards over $100,000. Even just a small amount can make such a big impact later down the line. Um, back to financial planning. Really, that, that is just like the exit strategy from us. It was just so incredibly important. Um, next is, if you are going to open a bar, best advice I can give you, don't fucking tell anybody. Everyone just goes, when are you opening? When are you opening? When are you opening? When are you open? You're you're like, it's open when it's fucking open. Um, like... All you're going to do there is add absolute crushing pressure onto you that is just so unwarranted. You've already got enough on your plate. People knowing and people expecting and particularly press, it's none of their business. You can tell them when you're open. That is the best advice I can give to you, mainly because we have done it so many different ways and silence is actually the best strategy. Um, I read a... Uh, an article in Bartender Magazine years ago where it was, just, um, it was maybe just like a throwaway comment, but I think it really, really stuck with me. And it was just making yourself bulletproof. And Sven Armeni in Bartender Magazine had mentioned that having break clauses in your lease agreement or your heads of agreement where if certain things don't happen, that you could walk away from this deal. Um, with lockdown, that posed one thing, you know, because you can't have the numbers or even people in your venue. 
But we have a 107-year-old cottage that people have lived in. It's not fit for purpose. It's a heritage build. We had to have different safeguards in there. So if we couldn't get the actual liquor license that we needed in order to operate and operate the concept of our pub, then we could walk away. And, and you know, church people are funny. <laughs> like three guys opening up a bar on what people consider sacred land. Some people don't particularly like that. That that poses some credible challenges, but we managed to get our license. We managed to get a general bar license, which meant we could trade. We could actually operate in the full extent and intention that we set out to do. But without that, I think we could end up with, you know, a cafe or a restaurant. And the house just isn't fit up for anything other than either people living in it or people drinking it. That, that, that's, that's it. it, it it's, it's so many awkward spots. There's no storage. There's no extraction. We can't have so many things because even the smallest thing, we have to go to Heritage Victoria to, to ensure that the building stays in the best possible nick that it can. Um, knowing your worth, really, I think walking away was a, a, a really good thing. And it really empowered us to be like, well, okay, well, if we can get over the line, we can do it. But I think it's knowing your worth in terms of, I suppose, like setting out with your core idea and sticking true to it. Now, you can stick to your idea, but it has to evolve because our business has evolved. You know, at one point there was three of us working in there. Now there's nine people and each have their own issues, personalities, you know, anything that they can add, their backgrounds. So, while I say stick to what you believe is true, there has to be some element of flexibility in there. And I genuinely believe now that they are the best things of our business, but our core idea is still the same. It's just, that circle is just rippling a little bit more. Um, press. Press are on your side, but they don't always get it right. So, never trust nobody. How we tackle press, uh, was just to ignore them. <laughs> we have the we have the ethos of we want to be bulletproof. We want to be ready. We don't want to be busy from the get go. If you tell everyone that you're opening, when do you think they're going to come? They're going to come at the first opportunity. And do you think you're ready? I mean, like we didn't turn our sound system on two two days beforehand. You know, like we didn't have a back bar, we didn't have uh, rails for our records, we didn't have plants, we didn't have so many little things in there. The first night that we actually uh, opened the bar just for friends and family, Ryan and I were having a panic attack, and the next day we came and changed every single light bulb in the venue. Like, and since then we've probably changed them three or four more times, because you're not going to get it right first time. And if you invite everyone that's going to talk about your business and project about your business, it has to be absolutely as good as it can be. When I say like do friends and family, use them as not as a party. It's not a like, congrats, we're open. It's what's going wrong? What can we make it better? How can we assess our business in its first point when no one's going to give you negative feedback? Everyone's going to go, oh, it's great. Do you think press are going to do the same thing? No, probably not. Like They are on your side, but you have to take it with a pinch of salt. We did the opposite in the pop-up, and that's why we tackle press in that way. We told everybody. We fucked up. Like We made so many mistakes. The other thing that happened was all our press came in the first two weeks, and then there was nothing staggered afterwards. Like We had to generate it, which means you're causing yourself to do more and more work further down the line. That is an incredible amount of pressure that we had to live with in our first iteration, you know? So I think, really, be bulletproof, not busy. You will get there eventually if you're doing something right. You don't have to do it from day one. Um, we control our narrative, I think, exceptionally. It's one of those things that you might not think of, but Whenever we deal with press, there's always a statement from us. It's not an interview, it's what, what we want to talk about. We have press packs with photos of different areas, different drinks ready to go so we're not getting photographers that we don't know in our venue taking pictures that we might, might not like. I think the amount of interviews 
or photo shoots and stuff that I've done and I don't see it until it's in print. Like, we just don't do that anymore. You know, most, um, most photographers, most um, journalists, they're pretty good. If you just say, can I just have a once over? You're not looking to critique it. You're not looking to ask them to rewrite it. You're not asking them to, ba- like, to babysit them. You're just asking just for proof. That's it. Just before it goes out, you save yourself an immense amount of time, pressure, but it's also you just controlling anything that's speaking about your business. Other thing that we do is, if ever there's a photo shoot for drinks and stuff, it's our iconic drinks or what we consider our iconic drinks. Are. So like, there'll always be a shot of Guinness in there. There'll always be our house martini. And we always reference the venue as a pub. Now, those things that you might not think of are subliminally, like, intrinsically set so the narrative is consistent every single time. Um, Obviously, the fucking good Guinness. Um, (laughs) Staying humble when it's good. Like, we have had a pretty incredible year. Um, I'm not going to, like, jump into everything that we've we've won, but it's been been monumental. It's not the business that we set out to do. We didn't open a business to win wards. It's pretty awesome but anything that we've won if there's a trophy or whatever it lives in our office it lives out of sight but you don't need to throw it down people's necks in our opinion that you're winning these things like just let them judge it by by your service by your drinks by the environment you don't need to tell people how good you are just let them f- figure it out yourself um one thing that we always knew like listen we've got 22 seats in our venue we're licensed for 50 because we expanded outside. We're expanding upstairs as well. But we always knew that we're going to get, we've got three huge corporate offices all around us. So we knew that we kind of, we could fill that gap between, you know, four and seven o'clock with after work drinks, whatever. What we really didn't consider was how many tourists there are now. Um, I think it's a testament to Melbourne for coming back stronger, really. Um, also for like, you know, Victorian government actually putting on festivals like Melbourne Comedy Festival, Melbourne Food and, West, Fine, uh, Melbourne Food and Wine Festival. The, uh, all the art stuff's going on, rising. Like Melbourne is such a draw card for people now. And I think we just didn't consider it. Like this year has been back to back. Every single week there is something going on. There's a reason to be in Melbourne. Like trying to capture those tourists. We had a bad review the other day that said, it's all tourists, no locals. I don't agree with that. I think we pretty much know 80% of the people's names in our venue at any one time. And if we don't, we make the effort. But tourists are people too. They're coming to enjoy your city. You should really pay attention to, to those people. You know, you might not see them again, but sure as shit, they'll tell someone when their friends are coming to Melbourne, their family's coming to Melbourne. If you don't have a good job, they'll tell them. I say this with a pinch of salt. Most people are fucking idiots. Um, we, we finished you know, a full calendar year um, with a five-star Google review as an average, which is fucking cool. Like, there was, like, 148 uh, reviews. And finishing high was great. And I'll be honest, I, I obsessed over it. Every day, I'd probably check it two or three times. So if there was something new. And then, you know, you get a couple of bad ones. And that's okay, too, because if there's something consistently being said about your business, then you need to pay attention to that. You know, if there's a lack of communication, if it's too warm, it's too bright, the music's too loud, all right, if a few people are saying it, probably incorporate that information. But most people who give you bad reviews, they review bunning sausages. You know, like, I went on, I went on someone's, like, Google reviews, and they, they reviewed the Eastern Freeway. You know, I hope this person's not in our venue, and if you are, this is exactly what it feels like. Um... Four stars, my new favorite. That's, that's genuinely what you're competing against. And I, I'll, I'll be honest, like, you know, we were discussing yesterday, did we remove a name? It's like, they put a review on an open forum. This is an open forum as well. It's just the same thing. But genuinely, that is what you're competing with. That's, that's who you've got to make happy. You know, you can do absolutely everything and it might not be enough. I hope it's just a slip and they meant five. In my mind, that's what it is. <laughs> um, never sell no crack where you're at. We don't sell crack or condone it. Um, but genuinely, we, between the three of us, we consider ourselves sharks. And not in an aggressive way, but we just don't function when we're still. 
we are constantly busy. Like if the view is just service every day, all of us kind of crumble a little bit. We don't function very well when it's not very busy. <laughs> um, thank God that it, that's very few and far between these days. But generally, we are so proactive in finding work or revenue to either support us, support another venue, support another venture, just to work with other people. Um, when we were opening up the pub, um, Matt actually went and um, helped out some country pubs in country Victoria, helped them like kind of up their game, you know, in service, um, drinks, all that kind of stuff. And I think it doesn't, your revenue streams don't have to be basic. They don't have to be, oh, I'm consulting on this new restaurant that's opening up. It's like, there was so much value and so much that we learned going into these old pubs that we now implement into our own venue. Because if we wanted to be an authentic pub, there's things that we've never worked in them. So we need to incorporate these things to make it feel authentic. So in two years, three, time, two, three four years time, that's what it is. Um, multiple revenue streams actually gives you, all right, you're working harder, you're working more, but it means that your business isn't relying on the turnover. Uh, consultancy, like saying, having a really diverse um, opportunity to make some money is pretty important. We're pretty, we're pretty diverse in terms of our skill set. I'll get onto that a bit later, but you know, Ryan does video photography, anything that's kind of based away from human beings. He's pretty sharp at, you know, and he also doesn't have any kids, doesn't like sleeping. So, um, it means that, you know, if, if we're on short deadlines, which invariably we are, that his phone is never off. I think having that ability sets us apart. Um, contracts with suppliers. We have a philosophy that I adopted from one of my old works was you're opening up a bar, you might be a high profile bartender and all these big distribution brands want to give you cash. And that's great. But don't forget that it does lock you into a lot of things. It does hamstring you a touch. So our philosophy is uh, take less, work with more. You know, we didn't take a great deal from from um, from our distributors. It does allow us to be flexible. It means that we can change on a dime. We can work with as many people, whether that's doing a like, you know, a brand launch and we've got a three day turnaround. It means that we can do it because we don't have to consider where does that put us in terms of our contracts. Um, and I think that for us, just having a bit of freedom, not feeling like somebody is a silent partner in our business because they contracted it to it, I think was a really big point for us. Um, Matt's OnlyFans as well gives us quite a lot of money as well. It's just like, um, that's at meat feet. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, Matthew, I didn't think you were going to be here. <laughs> um, that goddamn credit, I think I hate our accountant. <laughs> I really, I think he should carry a plant around with him to replace the oxygen that he steals from this planet. Like, but he's good. You don't have to, you don't have to like these people. If they're good for your business, then as long as they're not in service, they're, they're of service. I think they're pretty good. Now, with our accountant, this is something that being in the first year of business, we really needed some help with and understanding your business outside of service is so important. It just goes back to that exit strategy and how we deal with money. This is three young lads doing this. Is it young? We're 40. Um, young at heart. Um, this is three guys doing this for the first time. So the risk and the pitfalls are a lot bigger than say, you know, we're year five, year six. We've got more people. We've got more heads talking to us. This is like, this is incredibly important. Like I say, you don't have to like them. They just have to be good. But I implore you, if you're going to ever do a bar, your accountant should be one of the first people you tell. Um, going back to revenue streams, I say you're the last person to get paid. And I mean that in kind of every way encompassing. That's, you are, you have a role and responsibility to make sure that the minority is the priority in your venue at any point, whether that's financially, with mental health, the culture that you set. Um, you're not the most important person in your venue. Um, your staff are really. So I put that in there, it's, it's a little bit bigger than 
um, than what it might suggest. Uh, keeping your family and business separated, I think, kind of deals a lot with our mental health. Um, we open up four days a week. There's three of us that are in the venue when we first opened. We were too busy. <laughs> you know, what we have on Friday, we have seven staff. We do kind of the same numbers that we used to do, and we used to do it with three people. Like, we saw do a men new menu every week, plus consultancies, plus trying to pay our business off, plus trying to pay us. It's too much. Like, for us, hiring people was part of that exit strategy as well. But just giving ourselves a bit of a life back, you know, easily for the first three or four months, we were doing 120 hours each, pushing each other as well, when sometimes we just needed to stop. I think there's, my dad is like 75 years old and every time I go home, my dad is like up on the roof doing shit. Like he's so busy even after a time that I say sometimes doing nothing is the value. It's not just sitting around, it's not wasting time, but just energy where you're not expending just to get things over line. Some things aren't that important, but you think they are in the moment, they're really not. Um, we are only open five days at the moment. We expanded another day, so we added Tuesday to our roster. That allowed us to have a bit more staff, another day to give an identity to, but everyone says, when are you going to open up another day? On a Tuesday and a Wednesday, if we're busy both of those days, it gives us an extra $8,000 extra on those two days. If I open up on Monday, you might only earn $4,000, but it's cost you probably $1,200 to open, not including all your cogs as well. So like, there's more value in us operating five days, building up those Tuesdays and Wednesdays to get them to you know, generate another three, four grand. And we're not adding another day to our roster because essentially like, when you're an owner, the book stops with you. you know, we don't like asking our staff to come and do extra days. It affects them, affects their planning, affects their families, affects their mental health. So for us, it's solidify the days that you are open, garner more money from them, rather than just going out and just going, well, we need to earn more money, we need to open more days. It's the most basic form of doing it, like, but that, again, was all part of our financial planning. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs> um, I, that's quite brave. <laughs> um, going back to like uh, we were working 120 hours we were like we're a shell of, of human beings um, I was driving home I live uh, out towards the Yarra Valley and I nearly I nearly crashed my car going 100 k's an hour on the on the freeway I fell asleep at the wheel and I was terrified I was like really shook up I was emotional um, I've got two kids, I've got a wife, um, this is a real wake up call for me ironically and that was like what's better, you know, having a successful business and working all these hours or, you know, my wife remarrying and bringing someone else, bringing up my kids, no, um, for, for me this was huge, like it was so big that I didn't want to lie to my wife about it, I had to tell the truth. And I had to be honest and say, something's got to give, something's got to change because the way we are running ourselves, not even our business, and we're pushing each other is going to have like a dramatic effect. So I think that was a good enough reason. Next, I'm just going to jump out of that emotional state. And uh, this is how we structure our menus. So originally we ran our menu every week where we have... Uh, Three classic cocktails, three contemporaries that we create ourselves, a house martini, which never changes, and a punch, which does rotate as well. Um, so essentially, it's like coming up with seven new drinks in your own house style on a weekly basis, prepping, resurging. And it's tough. Like, it's tough when particularly Matt was looking after front of house, Ryan was looking after back of house, and I'm doing the drinks. It's so much pressure. It's another like factor in where I got to with the car crash. It was just too much. This is how we structure it now that we have staff. So 
to get everyone included, no matter whether you work on the bar, the floor, or you're a host, you're a glass washer, everyone has a say in it. So at the start of every month, before the month, we write someone's name, uh, pair them up with somebody of varying uh, ability and kind of task them. It, like, it spreads the load. It also gives our staff just a little bit of a kind of involvement, but genuinely, like, if they're drinks on the menu, it gives them so much pride. It takes a massive amount of weight off my shoulders. Some of them are better than me. So, like, you know, the end product there is, is, uh, is better for it, you know? I think that not even just delegation, just letting go a little bit of your business, even something that you find, like, particularly me, I find that's my role. But it isn't. Like, it was my role to set it up. It's my role to manage it. But like I said before, like having people in your venue working with you, they're going to offer so much more because their backgrounds, their tastes, their dislikes, you know, the cultures that they're part of, subcultures, music, anything. Like, I'm not part of them. Um, how we deal with brands, we spoke just briefly about, we don't go all in with, with everyone. What that allows us to do is we give 60% menu share and one of them is always the martini which is Plymouth it gives us like two or three spots really that we can go all right that's an Australian brand that we really want to work with this is one of our friends who is tasked with like a KPI whatever this is a new launch so we really want to help them out there um, this is just some stuff that we've got left over like trying to negate wastage is really hard when you don't have the flexibility to do it you know, it's like creating opportunity for in order not to consume is really good. I am also a hoarder as well, so I never throw anything out. I think one of my friends says that I, I watch hoarding programs and find things I need. So, <laughs> um, so I, I, again, like we started out so rigid and it's just not that way anymore, you know, and that's down to our staff. That's also down to just giving them freedom and, Freedom of expression and freedom to breathe, really. Um, I kind of didn't choose my business partners. Matthew and I have been best friends for close to 15 years, so it was kind of good timing for him, great fit for me. Our families are really close. Um, Ryan, I don't think, is from this planet, so um, he was uh, an early addition, but I kind of sees the engine room for us. We did a task years ago, um, essentially called Rate Your Mates. And it was like, come up with your skill set, write down everything you think you're really good at and what you want your role to be within this business. This is before we had anything. And then do it for the other people as well. And then when you put all the, the answers together, if there's any correlation, then that becomes your role. If two people say you're shit at it and you say you're great, then that's a conversation that we need to have as well. Um, it, our roles haven't changed really, Matt, have they? In four or five years of doing this, they're still, they've expanded, they're, they're busier, but they've not changed. There is a, there is set a stone. I, um, I'm a bit weird. Like I have a tick. I can't particularly eat around people. Um, I have no control over what my face is doing 99% of the time. Um, Matt says he can tell my expression from the back of my head. I, I'm a little odd. I'm a little weird, but that's okay too, because, you know, in life and conversation and stuff, I might not be great, but I moved to a different ry rhythm as a lot of people. I see things a little bit differently. I pay attention to the things that most people forget. So it's not quite a superpower because I'm still shit when there's a group of more than four people. But, you know, like, there's value in it. And with that, we are so strong with our culture in our venue. We have already come across so many um, issues that require thought, time, consideration, and emotion. I don't know how people own a business on their own. I really don't because there's value in somebody telling you no a lot of the time. You know, whether it's an idea or, you know, a belief, whatever. I think when there's three of us, there's democracy. Um, and sometimes you really want to get something over the line. It's just about picking your battles, really. 
when you've got two people saying no and you're the only one charging, we never bring it up after that. After that meeting and you don't get something over the line, you just go, maybe next time, something else. It's about picking your battles and keeping that partnership as strong as possible. Culture for us um, is not only what, how we treat our staff, we treat our environment, we treat our guests. It's also what we project out, um, what people see. You know, three cis white males uh, own a venue. We, uh, <laughs> yes, sorry about that, Matthew. Um, we project out the world that we kind of want to see, and that sounds really cheesy, but the amount of feedback that we get from, like, particularly the LGBTQ plus um, community is big. We have a progressive pride flag behind the bar. You know, those small symbols mean so much to a minority that particularly had it historically and still now has it quite shit. You know, seeing a symbol of something that community that they're a part of is powerful. When people ask me, like at the bar, is this a gay bar? It's like, yeah. Because I know it's going to make them uncomfortable and that's great. That's, they're in the wrong, you know? Like, um, and, you know, if they are part of that community, then they, again, by saying yes, you feel safe. Right? We also have a Liverpool Football Club uh, banner in there as well. If anyone wants to talk about football, show us the safe space. Um, like I said, I, I'm not normal. <laughs> All of us um, see counsellors. I think when it's good, when it's bad, we're openly talking about it. Um, I was really proud of my business partners the other day. We'd had a shocker of a year. Like, busy, busy beyond the belief where you don't have time just to manage just basic things. Uh, we have a brief every day before service where we can get things off our chest, where we can analyse the night before any issues, where we can implement something new. And my business partners turned around to the staff and said, I'm not great today. Both of them. I think showing that honesty and that vulnerability is so underlooked. I think it's really important that they see that you are human and, you know, sometimes putting on a brave, brave face is not always the best way to go. Um, I think doing things like that really galvanize our team. They also show that if they're having an issue, that there's two guys also not having a great time as well. I think it's pretty powerful. I was like, really, I was beyond, beyond stoked for them. Now, I, I kind of want to concentrate on a member of staff here. As, like I said, I'm not normal, and that's okay. But I thrive in really, really tight environments where I'm allowed to. I did a talk years ago for Coleman's Academy and it was based as a, a, a long-winded thank you to my business partners for creating a space where I could be me, like unadulterated, where I could lean into my weirdness, what sets me apart. But that's only down to them. And um, we had a CV come through, unreal references. When I checked on the references, all of them said mental health issues. Matthew and I had a conversation about it. It was like, well, maybe it's the environment they're not in. You know, um, for us, this is a learning experience. If it goes bad, we know what to do better next time. If it goes bad, we tried. If it goes bad, the learnings from it are, are just as important, right? Um, I, I, I would say, and I'm crazy proud of this, this person is, my favorite employee, putting them in roles and understanding their environment, what their needs are, what their goals are, what their skill set is, and honing in on that and giving them the space to breathe and be that and giving them support every single day. Unreal. I, I like, I genuinely, if, if, if anyone ever is in the same situation as me, push yourself. Push yourself to create an environment where that person can thrive because I've been that person before. I've had jobs where I wasn't happy, I was capable, wanted to learn, and just the environment is not right for me, so I don't work. It's a fish out of water situation, so. What does year two look like for us? Don't worry, front row, I'm getting to the end. Um, uh, 
I think for us, it's like solidify what we're doing, grow our team, get better at the things that we're not particularly like, I don't know, you know? Growing to grow is so important for us. It's not doing everything right the first time. It's setting yourself up and having proper preparation every time. We'd like to challenge what our capabilities are as a music venue, whether that's doing less takeovers globally, getting better DJs in, um, better than Tim. Um, why a bar isn't on the horizon? Going back to the press thing. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. It's none of your fucking business. <laughs> um, I'm going to wrap it up right now. Um, I just want to say thank you very much for the opportunity to be able to do this as well. It's, um, it means a lot. Um, please, if you are in, a, in the hospitality industry, please start using gender neutral language. It's not hard. It means a lot to people. It might not mean a lot to some, but those that it does, it, it makes a massive difference. Less of this, hey guys, how you doing? Just fucking say hello, you know, welcome. You don't have to pinpoint it. You do slip up and that's okay, but it's the fact that you try, it makes a big difference. Please, please have symbols in your bar for minorities. Again, it makes a massive difference. Thank you very much.